Recently, we've seen massive political uncertainty in the state of Maharashtra, where a majority of the Shiv Sena MLAs sided with the BJP to bring down the Uddhav Thakre government, uh, form a new government in partnership with the BJP. Uh, but what we are seeing in UK is at a completely different level of politics. Uh, Boris Johnson forced to step down because minister after minister of his own cabinet and leaders in his party simply not having the confidence in their prime minister. Joining us for perspective on this fascinating political story and what could happen from here is one of the best known journalists in the United Kingdom. You've got Martin Wolf of the Financial Times joining us at this moment on India Today. Mr. Wolf, uh, welcome and it's fantastic to have you back with us on India Today. Great pleasure. You know, you happen to be in India at a time when there's massive uh, political uncertainty in your own country and in London. Uh, what do you think was the last straw? Because from what uh, Boris Johnson had been saying in public, he was a man who was refusing to step down. No matter what the scandal, what the controversy, he wanted to bash on regardless. What do you think took Bojo down? Well, I think it's reasonably clear and surprising in a way. There's been a long series of what might seem individually minor scandals. And in each of them, the Prime Minister has been caught breaking the rules or lying, uh, sometimes even to the House. And the last one was a scandal uh, concerning somebody called Pincher, uh, Mr. Pincher, who was one of the senior whips, who is t turns out to have been both a, uh, a drunkard and uh, uh, a sexual harasser of men, apparently. And uh, Boris Johnson knew the, uh, this about him, but appointed him anyway. And when it came out, he uh, seems to have lied about his knowing about it, and that then came out. And I think for many senior cabinet ministers, um, that was just too much. They just swallowed too many lies and they felt this was going to go on and on and on. And so Rishi Sunak, uh, our Chancellor, and Sajid Javid particularly, who is our Health Secretary, together resigned and that really started off the run which we've seen. And what made um, Boris have to resign is quite simply that he ran out of ministers. So many ministers and about all junior ministers resigned, as well as senior ministers, that he couldn't really run a government anymore. Well, if you can't run a government, uh, then you can't be prime minister. And behind all this, of course, is the Conservative Party's concern, always dominant, that Mr. Johnson had become a liability in politics, that he was going to lose the next general election, as he'd lost recent by-elections. So they had to get rid of him in favor of somebody else. And the Conservative Party has done this very often. It's not very surprising or new. What's your sense of Bojo's popularity? Because there's been so much comparison between Boris Johnson and Donald Trump in the United States. And in the end, we saw when Trump went to the polls, he lost by a whisker. Do you think Boris Johnson's popularity at this moment in the UK has crashed so much that he has led his party to an electoral debacle? Or does he still have some traction on the ground? Well, nobody knows uh, what would happen, and we'll now never know because we won't have that general election. Um, I wouldn't say that Trump lost by a whisker. I would say that Trump said he, he won, but he really lost pretty decisively, I think by seven or eight million votes, if I remember correctly. Um, what would have happened if Boris Johnson had been uh, uh, leading his party into a general election sometime hence? Nobody will now ever know. What is certain is he, his party was well behind in the polls. The approval ratings for him in the polls were very low. He clearly on that basis lost popularity. The Conservatives had experienced debacle in recent by-elections and the Conservative members of Parliament um, particularly those elected in marginal seats in former Labour constituencies, but also others, began to be concerned that it would be a debacle. And the belief is enough to get rid of the Prime Minister. Remember, the Prime Minister is not an elected head of state like the US President. 
He's just the head of the government. And to be the head of the government, he has to control his party in parliament. And if he doesn't have the confidence of his party, he's finished. Of all the leaders who seem to be in the reckoning to succeed Boris Johnson, what's your assessment of the probability of uh, someone coming in and taking over? Who do you think is most likely? Why? And how do you see the race at the moment? Well, I was just looking at a list. It's a very long list, about 10 or more candidates. None of them seems to have a decisive position, at least as far as the poly, the pollsters and the, the gamblers as well. There are lots of gamblers on this uh, go. Um, we, I see that Ben Wallace, the Defense Secretary, about whom we know very little, he's just become prominent because of the Ukraine war, is at the top. Um, uh, Rishi Sunak is also close to the top, the former Chancellor. Um, the, the list is really long. And what happens now, in the nor if the normal process is carried through, which I expect is supposed to be carried through by September, is that the, the House members, the House of Commons, will choose two of these candidates to put forward to the party members at large, and they will choose from those last two. So they're going to have to whittle down this number to two, and that's in successive rounds. It's just wildly unpredictable. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if Mr. Wallace won because he would be sort of a safe candidate. He's a tradition, more traditional Tory with a uh, sort of more traditional Tory manner. But then, of course, the question they have to ask is would he keep the former Labour seats, which are so important for their majority? Uh, would he win back the, the middle classes who are pro Brexit, um, uh, sorry, anti Brexit? I think we really don't know what will happen, and we certainly don't know whether whoever takes over will have the sort of popularity that Boris Johnson had a few years ago. In the candidature of Rishi Sunak in particular, there's a lot of interest in India. Your of broad sense of whether uh, Britain is at this moment ready for a prime minister uh, who, who has the kind of origin and background that Rishi Sunak does, given who he's married to and generally his ancestry, a lot of people would wonder whether someone like him uh, can become prime minister of uh, Britain. How, he, how do you perceive his track record, his popularity, and what he could do to his party's prospects in the next elections if he gets this opportunity? I am inclined to think, this may be optimistic, but I am inclined to think the fact that he is of Indian origin would not be important. Uh, the, I really do, do think um, that the Conservative Party is not, in fact, a racist party, and that that would not be a problem. Uh, the, the problems will be rather, yes, the immense wealth of his wife, and the, uh, the story we had a few months ago that he, she had been um, exploiting perfectly legally a very special tax loophole. Um, that was a, probably quite damaging for him. It made him look not, n not a normal sort of person because the family is so wealthy. The, and I think he's, he has been uh, in many ways quite a successful chancellor and he's clearly a very clever man. There's no doubt about that. But uh, he's chopped and changed quite a lot as a chancellor. So people don't know um, what he really stands for. And that, that gets the third really big issue. He's young, inexperienced. He doesn't have a long track record. And so we don't have a real sense of what his ideology is. Uh, what he can offer um, voters that will promise them a better future in an economy which is very badly hit by the current economic crisis, the so-called cost of living crisis, and longer term slowdown. So I would say the issues about him will not be at all that he's Indian, but rather whether he's a really good minister, whether he has the necessary experience uh, so young and whether he has really good ideas which will convince people that he's the right man to lead the country in a crisis. Has he been able to uh, argue his case convincingly in your view? How do the people of Britain 
perceive his candidature at this moment? So we've spoken about his origins, but about, you said he's bright, but what is the perception around him? Well, as I said, I've discussed that. The, his view was that he did a lot of good things as Chancellor. He's found it more difficult since then. He's chopped and changed quite a bit in what he's been trying to do, uh, and particularly on how much he can, should help the more vulnerable people uh, in the country in response to the huge energy price shocks. We're suffering the high inflation. He's changed a lot, so that's a perception that, uh, that he uh, vacillates a bit. And I don't think he has begun to set out a completely coherent um, view of the bigger challenges in Britain and Britain society. I mean, the, the Chancellor, the Exchequer job is the only job in politics he's really done. Um, so I would say at the moment he's, uh, he's, he's seen as somebody we're not quite sure about. We don't know about, about him. He hasn't been around long enough but to have a real sense of the sort of person he might be. And my own feeling is, in fact, that he is still too young and too inexperienced. It would be good for him to do uh, another service, another period of service in a major ministry before he gets to be leader of the country, which is a very difficult job. Interesting. I want to come back to the comparison between President Trump and Boris Johnson. Uh, there's been a trend we've seen of how politicians seem to be getting away with the kind of scandals which may not have been allowed in the past. You know, earlier there'd been a much bigger sting. Possibly someone like Prime Minister Johnson might have had to step down earlier. He stretched it. Donald Trump's ability to withstand scandal also seems quite unprecedented. Do you think, like with Biden, uh, the UK too could revert to a more normal sense? Or do you think there is now greater appetite among citizens in the era of social media uh, to be okay with some scandals which otherwise would have been completely unacceptable from our politicians. I think it, it, it's very difficult to compare Trump with Johnson or the US with UK. I think we really are very, very different, except that there is a populist element in politics and a rejection of some of the more traditional forms of political behavior. So Johnson was a little bit of a scoundrel, and we knew that, and he was attractive, uh, perhaps in part because of that. But I do think that um, the sort of fears people have with Trump, I think rightly that he was going to overturn elections, or trying to overturn elections effectively to mount a coup, that was never relevant in Johnson's case. The scandals around him are real, but they're not massive. He has interfered a lot with institutions, but he hasn't really changed that much. I would say that Johnson is somewhat aberrant, but not to an extreme degree in the fundamental institutions of British political life continue to function more or less as normal. Um, and that's shown by the fact that they've got rid of him. Uh, and his own party has got rid of him, while the Republican Party has backed Mr. Trump to the hilt. Uh, even after he left office. I think the contrasts are bigger than the similarities. Interesting, yes, very interesting. I do agree that there is a, 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 a skepticism about traditional politicians and a desire for more entertaining, lively, apparently anti-conventional politics politicians. And that is something we have seen in both countries. Last question, Mr. Wolf. I'm reading an article in The Telegraph which says some prime ministers make history, others are part of it. Boris Johnson is obviously in the first category, just as Theresa May. How will history, in your view, remember Prime Minister Johnson? What do you think his lasting legacy will be? I think that's a very, very difficult question. There's absolutely no doubt that he is one of the most significant politicians in recent British history, and by recent I mean since the Second World War. I don't think Brexit would have happened without him, and Brexit is an enormous political and economic change for the country, and it needs social change. Personally, I think it's a disaster, but there is no doubt 
in, I'm, in my view, it wouldn't have happened without him. This makes him a very important figure. Furthermore, the Brexit we got was very hard, almost as hard as it could be. Again, that was a result of what he did. So he's a really important politician. So we were remembered for that. He will be remembered for being a pretty poor prime minister when he was in power. Things ran away from him. He wasn't a disaster, but things ran away from him. He wasn't on top of things. He didn't have a coherent policy program as prime minister. And uh, then, finally, when people look back at him, they will see somebody who changed the country, but didn't then remodel it. His, what he really did was destroy something, namely the links with Europe. And people will judge the significance of that and the value of that by whether 30, 40 years from now they decide that for us to leave the EU was on the balance a good thing or a disaster. I know what I think, but it will be for my children's and my children's children's generation to decide whether this judgment is right. And I expect they will be arguing about it on both sides for the indefinite future. So a really important figure in British history, but his legacy is not clear now, and it may never be. It's always very fascinating uh, to talk to you. Very sharp original insights there. Martin Wolf of the Financial Times for joining us on the News Track. Thank you very much. Great pleasure. Bye.